dear listener, and welcome to the Metacast Crypto Corner brought to you by Navic. I'm your host, Nicola Vreke, or Nico for short, and today I'm joined by Chong C.A. An, Lars Doucet, and Anil Das Gupta. Um, today we're going to be discussing Ronin, Ronin's exploit, so we're recording this on the 1st of April, um, and this is going to come out next week. And we're also going to be talking about the current state of blockchain games. And as our backup topic, um, we'll be touching upon uh, a new regulation if we have the time. We'll see. Before that, let's talk a bit about who we are. So I'm hosting this main job is investing in blockchain games at Bitcraft Ventures. And then we have CA. Hey, guys. Yeah, my name is uh, Chong On or CA. Um, I'm currently the VP Head of Americas for Mythical Games. All right, and then Lars? Yes, uh, I'm Lars. I am an independent consultant, and I work with Novik a bunch, and I've um, got a game development background, and so I make games, and I analyze games, and I've written a lot about blockchain games. Awesome. And then Neil? I'm co-founder at First Light Games, a UK Web3 gaming studio. We're currently working on a title called Blast Royale. Awesome. All right, great crew to discuss this. It's been a hectic week. In blockchain gaming, um, <laughs> let's dive right in. Or before we dive right in, can I just get something off my chest? Um, so this is this is like my platform where I can just rant. So my <laughs> rant is about the term GameFi. I've been seeing this thrown around as a sort of catch-all for blockchain, like games that are into like related to blockchain, and it feels like it's coming from DeFi, and then they change the D with Fi, but just. Just to be clear, DeFi stands for decentralized finance. So changing the D into game makes this game finance or gamified <laughs> finance, which is, I guess, I mean, some games you could call gamified finance, right? I, I think Wolf Game would be an example. Um, there, are, there are some other uh, ones that, that I, I would I would call that. But if I see a pitch deck um, as an investor and it has GameFi as description of what what's being built. Um, not the best look for me. I, I prefer to use the terms um, blockchain games or crypto games. That's or Web three games. That's that's safer. Um, just just my take there. I don't know if if you guys want to add anything on that, but uh, yeah, uh, I would like to. Nico. I Go think ahead. that's really good. I I would very much agree with you in terms of the pitch side deck, but I have to say it's a term I use myself. So you can probably use your crucifix against me by yeah. the way. But the reason I use it is I find when I speak to other people who are involved in Web3, specifically from the financial side, that they seem to understand what I'm talking about a lot more when I use that term. If I say to them, I'm making like a blockchain game, they look a little bit lost. Mm. As soon as I say gamify, they're like, oh, let's have a conversation. So <laughs> look, I understand. I do agree with what you're saying, because what does it really mean? But I think it's one of those things how, you know, sometimes when you see a pitch deck and it's like, we want to be the Netflix of video games. It's like, you know, that might sound contrite, but you can understand it. So I think you're right, but I think it has its place in this world. It's a necessary evil. Okay. So feel free to use it. Know that if you send me a deck with that word in it, <laughs> you're, not, you're immediately a bit, 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 bit down. Lars, you're going to if say I could say one thing about it. Yeah, it's interesting because like I've seen games that pitch themselves as GameFi and I think there's like this kind of spectrum on blockchain games. Like you have your like real OG libertarian anarchist crypto games that are almost not interested in the monetary aspect. They're interested in the protocol aspect. Then in the middle, you have your kind of like, you know, your more traditional blockchain games. And then way over to the right, you have things that are literally just financial apps with pixel mm -hmm. art, basically, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like when I think of GameFi, I think of that far end of the spectrum. You know, where it's like, okay, this is just like 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 a DeFi Kingdoms is a good example, yeah. where it's basically just a DEX with like pixel art characters in it. And it's like, this is just a place you can go to like stake a bunch of tokens and like allegedly it has some like very thinly veiled like game mechanics. Mm -hmm. Um that is actually just it's just like a weird user interface, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. 100% agree. N Nico, if the game does have its built-in decks, would that consider it to be game fire? Is that not enough? Because I think that's a relevant point there. Some games do have their own decks built in part of their architecture. And then you could argue of it being somewhat of an exchange stroke market that it sort of finance, mm -hmm. maybe? I don't know. That's a question for you. I agree. I, mean, I think, I mean, honestly, like I think many blockchain games with open, open economies, whether they have a built-in decentralized exchange or not will be in some way financialized. But still, I don't think that, you know, game finance or something should be the core name, right? For me, it's more <laughs> of a like a, an open blockchain game or something like that. It's, um, look, it's a quirk. I like to rant about these things. Um, anyway, um, 
Cool. Let's let's dive in into like the the topics that we selected, right? So first of all, Ronin's exploits, big news of the um, of the week, probably of the month. Uh, this is major news, and it is the biggest hack in blockchain history. Which, if you know blockchain history, is is quite something, right? <laughs> there's That's been something. there's been some serious hacks. Uh, it is an itch. it is an achievement. It is an achievement. Yeah. So what happens, right? Um, and I think it's <clears throat> because we're on the crypto corner, we can maybe go a bit more into what bridges are, how they work, why they're risky, and stuff like that. Um, I'll, I'll do my best, like quickly laying the groundworks. And if you guys want to correct me or or add on top of that, then uh, we can do that before we talk about the ramifications of this all and where we see this going. Um, so essentially, what happens? Um, well, first, what is a bridge? What is Ronin? So um, about a year ago, I think, um, the game Axie Infinity built by Sky Mavis was still being run on, on Ethereum la layer one, which means that for every transaction that you did on the blockchain, you had to pay very high gas fees. Um, and so their solution to that, which I think was a really great solution, was they decided screw Ethereum layer one. Well, not fully screw it, but you know I'm going to build my own blockchain. So they essentially built or they copied the code base of Ethereum and they deployed it themselves. They called it Ronin and they said, okay, you know, we now have our own blockchain and we have free, um, free transactions, so no gas fees. Um, and so uh, this was actually the catalyst. If you look at the amount of users that they have, the amount of transactions that they have, um, that exploded from the moment they had that, right? Before that, every transaction you made cost you a few bucks. Um, so it's normal that once that barrier um, goes away, it's um, it was suddenly solved. Now, how does Ronin interact with Ethereum? And and that's key here. It is through a through a bridge, and a bridge is essentially a, a, a smart contract that exists both on Ethereum and on the Ronin bridge. Where um, you, if you want to get Ether from Ethereum onto Ronin, you deposit Ether into a smart contract, and it gets created on the other side. In on Ronin, and you you can then with the same address take that ether and use it within the Ronin ecosystem, and it works like that in order to avoid um, having more ether than exists on the main chain, um, and so that's very basically what happens there. You can do the same with ether. You can also do that with um, Axie with um, so Axie the NFTs, but also with tokens ERC twenty tokens like SLP access, and so that's initial uh, contract where the ether was stored was basically exploited. Um, and we can go maybe later after this talk why it was exploited. Um, and the ether that was was it was in there that represented the ether that was you know, living on the Ronin chain was basically taken out by the hackers. Um, and it was like 170,000 ether worth about 600 million and 25 million USDC. Um, so 625 around uh, that million in assets or in value of assets lost. So Nico, if you could just clarify for me, it's like, so I make sure I'm understanding correctly. Mm -hmm. So basically the way a bridge works is like, you have these two contracts, like the Ethereum never really leaves Ethereum, but it stays in that contract. And then you create basically vouchers on the other, yes. on the other blockchain that represent them. And so it's basically like there's Ethereum over there, as long as the original value doesn't leave this holding account, Correct. right? Like yes. a voucher for an Ethereum on Ronin is just as good as if it was a unit of Ethereum on real, on, on, on the Ethereum blockchain. And then all of the backstopping got like like just walked away. Exactly. Is what happened, exactly. right? And I was going to make this joke. It's a bad joke, but traditional finance guys might now be like, "Wait, do assets have to be backed by something in order to be valuable?" <laughs> um, okay, Lars, thank you for for laughing at that joke. It's um, it's it, this is Bitcoin talk for you know you need a uh, gold standard and and when 1971 we got right. off that and that's when everything went to shit. Um, anyway, so yes, in theory, on Ronin or on, a, on any layer two, actually, the amount of um, ether that lives there is exactly the same as was stored in the like the bridging contract, the the initial bridging contract on on the Ethereum chain. All right, now um, let's quickly talk about what happens. So one of the things that is important when talking about different blockchains is the so-called blockchain trilemma. And the blockchain trilemma basically means that if you're designing a blockchain, choose two out of three. And the three are one, scalability, two, security, and three, decentralization. Um, and so you can basically, basically choose two. And so Ethereum and Bitcoin, they choose very high decentralization and security, but they have limited, because of that limited um, um, 
scalability, so minute, limited amount of transactions per second that they can handle. And so what SkyMavis did, because earlier we said, oh, there's no transaction fees on our chain, it's gonna be, it's gonna be great and amazing. They said, okay, we're gonna have high, scal high scalability, but for that, they chose lower decentralization. And so this is the, the design mistake or cho a choice that they made, but this is what actually <laughs> bit them right now. So they only had nine validators. Um, a validator is actually like a address or a node that confirms transactions that says, okay, this is a valid transaction. Um, and five of those were, were hacked. The private keys were hacked. And because five of those were hacked, the hackers could then take the Ethereum from the original contract um, out of there. Um, so yeah, that's, 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 that's it. That's what happened. Anything I missed? I think that that sounds like everything to it. Um, was there um, so there was USDC as well, a much smaller amount, um, and that's some stable coin. Um, and it was twenty five million of that, and there was six hundred million in Ethereum at least at the exchange rates of the day. Yep. Um, but all the vouchers are so, so nothing was taken off of the Ronin blockchain, right? It was all the backstopping assets on the other side of the bridge. Yep. Right or was it the opposite? no no exactly that and ironically like there wasn't even like nothing went wrong on the blockchain end like it's not that the blockchain got hacked right there's some there's just some transaction like the validators got hacked um, yeah so I think everything... that's the important thing there yeah. isn't it to notice I, I was gonna say just quickly I think one other thing that's worth adding is that those validators four of them were in the same location and then they gained access to one more which wasn't I believe which was the the Axie DAO one but. I think already that kind of leads because you know initially you said was it a, a design choice or a design mistake? I think it's ex harsh to call it a mistake whether you believe in decentralized blockchains or more of a centralized approach because that really wasn't the issue here as to why things went right or wrong. Right as we'll probably get into, it was more of a a social hack you could call, sort of say social engineering problem you might say um, in terms of how things went wrong and yeah I think. A lot of people look at the story and and have like a lot of doubt over blockchain, but that it's not the issue here. You know, it's it's actually just IT security is the big problem here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wanna, I think you... that's I think that's like the critical piece here, right? So uh, I think all the points you made are super valid. Um, I think Sky Mavis made a decision at the time when they decided to have nine you know validator nodes. Um, it goes back to the the trilemma that you're discussing, right? I mean, they could have let's say had, you know, a thousand validators if they wanted to, but they were going for, you know, speed and performance and so on and so forth. And so they set it up in this way. But ultimately what it came down to is if you take a look at the, the DAO validator node, the exception that they had made because of product, you know, prior, right, when their performance was so high, it was actually creating congestion and so on and so forth. They made an exception at one time, right, to you know, essentially, you know, provide or, you know, I don't know the exact mechanism they, they leverage, but they kind of loosen some restrictions so that they can ease that congestion. But they never went back to actually close that exception out, right? So could one kind of point to this and say, hey, you know, I mean, look, like a lot of us that came from the gaming side of the business, we know it's hard, right? Making software is hard. And so, you know, did they have the right checks and, you know, balances in place when they're doing something like that? to you know, have someone dedicated to go back and say, hey, we should probably double check to make sure these things that we flipped off are gonna be get turned back on. And this particular hacker you know, took, took advantage of that vulnerability. And because of what Anil just said, like they had you know, four of the validators you know, nodes all in one place. So once they were able to backdoor in through that exception, then it was just like, here you go, get access to everything else, take majority control, and then, you know, essentially hack their way in. So, yeah, I mean, the blockchain actually didn't make a mistake or anything to that effect. It, it did exactly what it was designed to do. Um, but ultimately, it was a vulnerability that was, in my opinion, at least a human error. And they weren't able to go back and, you know, resolve it quickly enough. So, you know, here they are, right? Mm hmm mm hmm so what are you guys' key takeaways from this? I, I have a bunch. I think, you know, one is that um, it's interesting something like this happens and there's literally nothing you can really do about this because there's no help desk you can call. There's no bank you can call and like, hold those funds. It doesn't work that way. This is the blockchain. This is neutral. Uh, this is permissionless. Um, and so that is like, in this case, I guess, a bad thing. Um, 
but then I mean we, we can go into that later or this is more like a philosophical discussion about is it good that you know all of these things are you know non-reversible and immutable um anyway so so that's that's one takeaway and then the other one is that's it's clear uh, for me at least Sky Mavis is a games company first and um I think they like you know Ronin worked for a while, right? I mean, and I'm not saying that they didn't make a mistake or whatever, like this was to be expect expected, but I think, you know, blockchain, blockchaining is hard. Building a blockchain is hard. Building a bridge is also hard. All of that stuff is complex. And um, I think this speaks to, um, you know, more like blockchain as a service approaches or where, or, or, or like layer twos or, or scaling solutions that are built by people who are actually like, specifically like working on, on, on exactly that. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's going to be solutions where it's like, I think for example, in Avalanche, they, they plan on having subnets for each game. And I think these yeah, kind yeah. of frameworks, like um, Sky Mavis was really on the cutting edge here, right? You know, setting up this whole st thing by themselves. And and I mean, they had to, right? Because they were so early. Um, I don't expect this to happen too often because i think you know a lot of a lot of people are going to learn big lessons from this which is i guess you know a good thing i think my take is so i had when i worked for valve i had a colleague by the name of tony cox and he posted in the aftermath of this just this great quote um so i'm quoting him here tony cox when asked what they learned from something that went wrong junior devs will tell you about a plan to avoid making that mistake again senior devs will recognize the inevitability of human failure and explain how they built that assumption into their future planning. And that's what I think is the problem with kind of using the kind of cope of it's like, well, the blockchain wasn't hacked. You know, this was a social engineering failure. It's like that XKCD comic where it's like, you're never going to crack my password cluster. It's like, yeah, but I'm going to drug you and beat you with a wrench until you tell me the password. You know, it's like building a safe with like an iron plutonium lock and the safe is made of cardboard. You know, the weakest link <laughs> will be attacked. And if the most most blockchain hacks are social engineering mm -hmm. hacks and your money is just as gone and your company is just as effed and um i think you know you, we, we need like people who are serious in the blockchain space need to learn to accept the inevitability of this kind of failure and so this is where your like bitcoin maxis and your ethereum maxis and your anti-sidechain people come in like the people on that more anarcho libertarian side of blockchain and they're like you see this is why we were warning you guys about centralization i mean i'm kind of don't really have a staked out position of any blockchain thing because I'm just kind of a generalized blockchain skeptic. But it's like Axie made that trade off. And what's so interesting is that, you know, I actually I have a lot of respect for kind of the Bitcoin maxis, even if I'm definitely not one of them myself, is because there's a consistent position there. And it's like we choose this horribly like energy inefficient thing because it's proven to work and um, we bite all of the bullets and uh, the problem that Sky Mavis kind of ran into was that they, they wound up with the worst of both worlds, right? You know, we have these like centralized evil banks that can just like, if we want to take your money, we're just going to take your money and there's nothing you can do. And like everyone raises that specter. But with that awful power also comes the ability for, you know, Francine at customer service to be like, yeah, I'll reverse your fraudulent transaction. I will occasionally do that. That's not even an option here. Mm -hmm. Now it's like not only is there the potential for whatever this was, was it an inside job? Was it a social engineering hack? Who knows? But there's also no ability to reverse that transaction for you. There's the big evil bank centralization of you completely trust them. And when the value immutably escapes to the blockchain, there's no throwing it back. Mm -hmm. So there's like, it, it, it's kind of like you have to expend some effort to like, it, it's not even like the bad end of a trade-off. It's just like, well, like we were talking about a trilemma, right? They didn't even get two out of the three things. You know, they were presumably trying to get security and perf and scalability um, at the cost of decentralization, but they only got scalability clearly from the results. Mm -hmm. And I think it's kind of, um, but I don't really want to play a super blame game here. You guys can reply to that part if you want to. What I'm really interested in, um, just to make efficient use of this podcast, is whoever's to blame, who cares? Like, what, what happens mm -hmm. next, right? Like, I think the big questions are, uh, uh, is, um, sorry if this is changing the subject, but it's like, Will they get the money back? And if they don't, are their investors going to bail them out? And what happens if they get bailed out? What happens if they don't get bailed out? And then there's that whole interesting conversation of like, you know, Ethereum is not really backstopped by anything. I guess it's backstopped by proof of work, you know. Um, but like all of those vouchers are still on the Ronin Ethereum and like the values haven't plunged too much, you know, mm -hmm. like 
can they just have their like, you know, get off the gold standard kind of moment and just be free? But I'm just wondering, like, will they get their money back and will they be bailed out? And what happens in the yes, no situations to either of those questions? Great question. That's that's what I wanted to get to anyway. I have my thoughts. I'd love to hear um, CAs first. Yeah. Um, will they get their money back? Um, I don't know if they're going to get 100% of their money back, but I think they're going to get some of it back. Uh, and the reason I think this is like, because, like, what do you think? 50%, 25, hard 90? To say. Hard to say, right? Because it depends on what Sky Mavis <laughs> is ultimately willing to sacrifice themselves, right? Because like, you how know, would that work, say, for example, what's that? How, how would that work? I'm just like, if like for me, either it, you get all the money. It's where it gets placed, right? It's, yeah, so they've so put like some we, already so, on the like FTX So what's, what's listing. really interesting right now is the hacker has these funds sitting in, you know, wallets that we can all see. Right. I, I think mm -hmm. the way that the hacker has moved the funds around, either she, he's either flaunting, he or she's either flaunting it, mm -hmm. or they don't have the level of sophistication in actually trying to quote unquote launder the money. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know. Maybe this is a demonstration of like, hey, you guys have vulnerabilities. Right. And it was just a demonstration of how they were kind of trying to prove to Sky Mavis that you guys need to tighten some things up. Right. Some very basic things that as a software, as a service kind of company, you guys need to tie things. I don't know. That's one theory. Um, but ultimately, to answer mm -hmm. the question, you know, could they do something as simple as a bounty and say, look, you, you, you kind of figured us out. You caught us with our pants down. You took a significant portion that's going to hurt our community. Um, you know, like, here you go. Here's X percentage of the thing that you took. And then, you know, give the rest back. Could that potentially happen? Maybe. But that's a very interesting stance as a company to take, right? Especially as someone as big as Sky hasn't, Mavis. hasn't that happened before? It has happened before with other situations. Hasn't it? Right. And so And that's like a does that like involve like a promise not to press charges and basically like pretend that you were a security researcher? So I, I can't speak to the exact nature of the, the use case that I'm thinking about, but yeah, I don't they my understanding is uh, they did not press charges. Um, the a lot majority of the funds were returned. But that individual, because it was a massive hack too, I think it was something in the tune of like, you know, close to 200 million, like that individual got something like $10 million, right, for the hack. And they kind of considered him like a white hat that helped them, right? So, you know, mm -hmm. they're spinning the narrative to some degree. But the, the, the long-term ramification is, I think to your point, Lars, like how do you proceed forward and what are some of the, you know, like terms of service and, you know, the company protocols mm -hmm. that you need to have in place if and when you run into a situation like this, right? So this is where I think Sky Mavis is at in trying to like determine how do they move forward in that in that sense. But the second part of what you described around like the bailout portion, um, I'm not 100% clear on it, but from my understanding, the Axie Infinity Treasury I think has a significant portion of still some of their funding in there. So if they really needed to, right? without going back to the investors or like, you know, in the, in, the, in IRL with like finance, going to like the banking sector, going to the government saying, please bail us out. The Axie Infinity Treasury themselves could potentially, you know, uh, you know, remunerate the, the individuals got, that got their, you know, funds kind of stolen. It could, but it would completely deplete them at that point, right? So what are the ramifications mm -hmm. of that? But that is, a, that is an avenue that they can take. Right. And then, yes, the third option would be yeah, going to their investors and saying, hey, we can't deplete our you know, treasury in this way. Can you guys give us some more funding so that we can you know, do this while keeping our product safe? Yada, yada, yada. So it, it's, there's a lot of different options at play. And so I think it's going to be really interesting what ends up happening. And then, you know, the, the third topic that we may or may not get to ultimately around how you change crypto into fiat, KYC process and so on and so forth. That may also now factor into it moving forward, but ultimately the way I see it is every company is on notice when it comes to hacks, security, way you think about it. And out of the, the trilemma, the three things, when, we, when it comes to security and decentralization, I guarantee you a lot of companies are now looking at that extremely differently, right? Mm -hmm. What things do you almost need to centralize to protect the ecosystem of users and you know funds because now you're having real you know dollar values moving around that whole conversation is now this is like a watershed moment of of change that's coming and i think it's kind of needed to some degree right so anyway that's I, my take I on it but would love to hear your guys' thoughts go ahead lars yeah i think what's interesting is the, the bit about the trilemma is that 
any investor is never going to sacrifice scalability, right? Because that's how you go to the moon. And mm-hmm. so now that they're on notice about security, I think that is, it, I mean, if you believe the trilemma is ironclad, I think that means that like every, this is a major just push to even more centralization from here on out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think, so the way I look at it is um, the, what, what's the term that you use, Lars, that I actually like, like the, like the maximus, right? Like the, the guys that are way over here, that are like, nope, you have to right. be fully decentralized. You know, we have to be pseudonymous, this, that, and the other. I don't believe like that's the that's the future, right? Some things will remain in that way, and some applications will, you know, pr- flourish, you know, in that sense. But when it comes to things like games and you know things of this kind of nature that you know we're a lot accustomed to, I, I think it's going to be some type of a hybrid, and because it makes the most sense. Because ultimately, you know, whatever the technology is, right? What are we all trying to do? We're trying to create like great experiences for our players, for our users. So if you kind of think of it from that perspective and you, you want them to have digital rights ownership, the ability to trade and sell and own the things that they're actually putting money into while giving them like, you know, some kind of fun experience, hobby, whatever you want to call it. Like, well, how do you solve for that? Right. While keeping them safe, while keeping, you know, trust and security. All. So I think it's going to end up becoming some type of a hybrid eventually, certain pieces of it. But, you know, we'll see. <laughs> Anil, what do you think? Yeah, it's very interesting. I think CA hit the tone on a lot of it that I would agree with. I think it's hard to estimate how much money Sky Mavis will get back. I've seen so far that it seems like the hacker maybe, as CA said, is either not the smartest or is flaunting. He's already put quite a lot of the the money onto like listings like FTX, which is not the smartest way because that's exactly how the money could be reclaimed because they could decide to honor the agreement. And, you know, we'd... um, there was a, a couple who stole a lot of Bitcoin in 2016, I believe it was. Oh, right. and all of those funds were recovered because because mm-hmm. of the way that it was kind of handled. You know, going back to your kind of bounty things, at the end of last year, there were two bounties paid out by Polygon for similar reasons. Um, so really, it, to be totally honest, if the hacker knew their, their stuff, they could completely wash all of that money mm-hmm. and, and get away with it. There's mm-hmm. definitely ways to do it. I, I don't think I'll say it here because they want to give people ideas. Fundamentally, whatever my opinion is, I think it's bad for the industry. It's bad for crypto for this to happen. Like, you know, Sky Mavis should be congratulated for basically in creating an entirely new industry that I myself am very much a part of because of it. So, you know, myself and my co-founder who's our CTO, after hearing this news, we just looked at each other terrified. Like, mm. is this our end game? Mm. That you work your ass off, you, you create something amazing and then this happens to you. And, you know, all respect to Jiho for being on stage at the day of the attack and, you know, making the announcement and... Yeah, he, sorry to interject, but he handled that like a pro, right? When he got on stage, like I mean, yeah, I, like mid mid midstream on doing something at a convention, and they're asking him these questions. So sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but like I got to give him some props there too. It, it was amazing how he handled that. I agree. That that's C level for me. That's proof of the pudding. So I think that's a great, fa- you know, someone at a level. Um, I think that you know, answer some of the other questions. What can they practically do to kind of change it in the future? Well, one thing that surprised me though, why I brought up like the four being in the same location, is you can do multi sig, right? That's so, right. So, for example, having just nine nodes, there's actually quite a few layer twos that do that. Even some that are worth quite a lot of money, a lot more than Ronin, but they at least have multi sig, so they're not all in the same place. There's, I mean. Vitalik of ETH fame is notorious for saying he doesn't actually believe in layer two for a lot of these reasons, saying that bridges will always be like a vulnerability. I think what Lars said before as well about attacking the weak point. I mean, I was just nodding my head with everything he said. He's completely right. I mean, it is true. You know, the the, the safe that's a card, make cardboard door, but it's got an amazing padlock isn't going to do anything. So I think what will they do? I think that they will make more nodes. I think they will go multi-sig. They'll probably throw a few other things in there. I think there's not too much more they can do other than that. What will the investors do? I think most of the investors, because it really opened everyone's eyes, that even in a worst case scenario, I think they will prop Sky Mavis up because I think as well it won't look good for the industry as a whole if they were allowed to fail. I think, you know, they more than proved their worth. They were obviously, I would imagine they will uh, appoint like the most ninja cybersecurity person you've ever seen in your life. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, in a in a previous life, they killed Genghis Khan or something like that. That's just how secure they were. You know, they, they live in Fort Knox or something like that. That's how secure this person is. I think you'd have to do that as especially a company that's raised so much money um, and then try and move on with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think like the, the thing that you're bringing up is really interesting because like, yeah, why would it just sit there, right? Which is why I don't, I, I, you know, I, th- this hacker obviously had some level of skill in order to do a thing. The fact that it's just sitting there and it hasn't been moved when they had 
ample opportunity and time to do it, I think it signals something, right? So I think that's really fascinating. We could probably talk about at some other podcast, but I think the psychology of it is really, really fascinating. And then the other part too that um, I don't think we quite touched on yet is, you know, a lot of these, uh, you know, blockchains, these protocols, these different, you know, D apps that are on here, um, you know, they have, you know, various ways to interact, right? You know, from you know, without actually being a player in game. And so you know, I think the way that, you know, Sky Mavis wrote it out was the attack vector that this hacker took on was through a, what they call an RPC, a remote procedure call. Easiest way to think about it is it's, a, it's just an endpoint. It's basically an API, right? And so other games do this too, like um, like Dark Forest, for example, which is another really popular you know Web three game. They allow users to directly connect to that thing, right, and have you know various functionalities, so you can you know you know elicit some data, so on and so forth. Um, but it's really interesting that games of this scale, of this magnitude, and so on and so forth have those entry points, right? So I think these specific APIs are probably going to be refactored and you know rethought. And just really being considered now moving forward, like, is that a thing that we really need to do? And, you know, are those types of, um, you know, I guess, transparent nature of touching back to the product and making, you know, get and post calls, is that really a necessary thing? I think that's also going to probably change into the future. So, yeah, just something to like, you know, really think about because uh, Axie is not just a pure proof of stake, uh, you, know, uh, you know, from my understanding, it's, it's like a combination, right? Because like they were proof of authority, and then they, mm -hmm. I think they blend proof of stake, which is which is kind of crazy, which is very interesting in and of itself. But this hacker was because of the way that they entered through the RPC, through the DAO, through the validator nodes. Both of those things didn't ultimately matter, right? So yeah, I think it's gonna lead to a lot of really interesting discussions and hopefully innovation, you know, within the space, which is you know I think what I'm really looking for. Mm -hmm. There's there's two things that I'm kind of thinking about is that. Um, the first one is, I think there's this kind of like nuclear scary option everyone needs to think about is that what if the hacker is sophisticated enough to be like, can I really steal this? I know this vulnerability. Let me just take it. But not sophisticated enough to do what to do next mm -hmm. and just panics and just abandons the funds forever. You know, that happens in real life when expensive stuff gets stolen, like priceless paintings, ancient artifacts from museums. And they throw them in a dumpster and they run away because they don't want to get caught. And they don't want to go to jail for the rest of their life. And they don't know how to launder all this money. And you just never recover it ever, you know? And um, I think that's kind of a scary thought to think about. And I think it's, but I think it's at least as likely as any of the other options is that the money will never be recovered. And it will sit in that address taunting everyone forever. Um, I'm not sure if it's more likely than any of the other options, but it's something I'm thinking about. And another part, you know, when we were talking about how like Jiho handle this like a pro, um, I hate to cast aspersions, but I strongly, I mean, maybe his performance on stage was good, but Sky Mavis went six days either without noticing the breach or choosing not to disclose it. So either they didn't know about it, which means, frankly, they're incompetent because they should have been watching, like with, with stakes this high, they should have had security monitoring and they should have known immediately when that much money was missing. Someone noticed it only because someone tried to withdraw the funds. Short sellers allegedly, I, don't, I haven't followed up on this, short sellers allegedly noticed it and started making movements, which one of them might be the hacker, who knows. Um, so either they're incompetent or they're dishonest, which is it? And if I'm an investor and potentially if they're going to come to me and ask me, you know, potentially for a bailout or, you know, say it's like, oh, we're depleting the treasury or, or whatever, like I would start thinking if I really want these founders to continue running the company, you know, if they've had all of these problems stack up against them and now have the largest hack of all time, I would be thinking to myself, do I trust this leadership team if they have just gone from being the poster child of the success of blockchain gaming to just being the face of mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake? Is my investment safe? You know, that's what I would be thinking. And I just, I, I can't imagine how... I could have any confidence in someone who is either dishonest or incompetent, frankly, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's a really interesting uh, viewpoint. Um, I guess, if, so if I were to put myself into like Geo's shoes and like imagine kind of like what happened, you know, during the time that those like five days or whatnot, mm -hmm. five, six days when all the stuff was going down, I mean, having been not in this exact situation, but having been in other similar fires as it relates to game development and things going sideways, I can imagine the team just scrambling, right? Trying to figure something out. And I can imagine the guys, maybe maybe they don't have it in terms of monitors, 
you know, because you would imagine there's like a knock, uh, you know, having like triggers and trip points, right? Maybe they don't have that level of sophistication yet. So I, I want to give them the benefit of doubt because when you're doing something new and you're building a thing and it's challenging and they've been challenged to your point, Lars, uh, I don't know if I would call it a mistake, but they've had some challenges with their tokenomics. I think when you've got billions of dollars of valuation, it's a mistake and you owe it to your investors to hire the people to give you that, 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 that competence. But I think, I think, so, the, sorry, sorry I think the investors there. do are confident in this team, right? Which is why they got the valuation that they did because they've had a bunch of success before they got to what I would consider, uh, you know, some roadblocks, right? Which I think a lot of successful products over time, you're going to run into roadblocks, right? And so that's what they're currently faced with. And it just happens to be that as they're trying to, let's say, resolve their economy of the game and launch a new product in Origins and this, that, and the other, this thing happened, right? So it's a bunch of compounding effects. And it's, again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be defensive towards them. I'm just trying to be like understanding of the situation. And I can, again, imagine what it might be like for a small team there with a, you know, a massive billion dollar product trying to scramble and figure all this stuff out. Um, I, I think there's some level of let's wait and see until they disclose more information type of thing. Um, and yeah, like dishonest. I don't know about that. I don't know if I would push it that far. Right. I mean, I'm not I'm not saying like I know they are. I'm, I mean, and I, and I want to say like I can empathize being in that position, which is why I choose not to be in charge of billion dollar companies <laughs> um, because I can't take that kind of heat. Um, but like what I mean is like, I'm not saying they're definitely dishonest. I'm, I'm saying is it's like, we only have two choices. Like either they didn't know or they knew and they chose not to disclose and neither one looks good. Not knowing makes them come off a little better, but doesn't exactly give me a lot of confidence. Yeah. But I mean, when, when you something know? like when, the, when a big fire is happening, is your immediate reaction is like, oh crap, I just found out something, you know, really, really bad about what's happening. Let me go to my PR team and write up a draft saying, hey guys, this is exactly what's happening. I think the natural reaction is, all hands on deck, swarm on the problem. Let's try to figure it out. Make sure it's a real problem, so on and so forth. And then I think as they recognize, shit, like we got to actually communicate this out properly. Then they even actually put together like their blog post and that because it was pretty polished the way that they kind of rolled out all the information. You could tell that it was a bunch of conversations happened. They put something together. They released it. Could the speed of that have been better? Like, would we be having this conversation if they released that 24 hours later, 48 hours later versus five days later? I don't know, right? But I, I think we can debate that point. Ultimately, I think they are trying to be transparent. Everything's on the blockchain, so it's not like it's not exposed, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's definitely some level of operational efficiency that they need to optimize against. But I, I wouldn't go that far. That's my personal opinion. <laughs> no, I, I respect your opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, um, man... Like I, I didn't even consider them not being truthful about this. Imagine if like you can see on the blockchain that they were actually taking out all of their funds, you know, after oh, they man. actually discovered this. Um, because you can you can trace that shit. So um that's yeah. Anyway, never considered that. Um I don't think that's true either. I I, I met I think um so I was at GDC last week. I met uh Gho's um and I could see it in his eyes. He didn't know what was up, you know. You would have seen it if if he knew what was happening. No, I'm, I'm kidding. But um, no, I well, I think you know it's the the fact that this was happening for like a week. It obviously, it doesn't like it's not very good, right? You should have checks and balances for this stuff. Um, so definitely a mistake there. But um, I don't think that they they knew. Um, yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, totally. I they they there's definitely areas of optimization, fixes, you know, new mm -hmm. new protocols within the organization that's going to need to happen for sure. Mm -hmm. Like to Lars's point, if I was a if I was an investor of, you know, their studio and then, you know, like yeah, I would probably start poking holes at all of the things that I think a lot of us, you know, take for granted or we assume is going to happen, right? Like all the different securities, all the different um, you know, processes and frameworks that you typically have in place when, you know, money is being exchanged. Yeah. I, I think I think to some degree it's good. And the positivity of all of this that I really like about Web3 is like, look at the community response, which is really fascinating, right? I honestly thought that, you know, their their token prices were going to drop and I was going to buy that dip, but it, it didn't drop as much as I thought it was going to. It was actually surprising that it's kind of like, you know, kind of holding on where it's at right now. I mean, time will tell, obviously, mm -hmm. how that's going to all shake out, especially with all this amount of funds locked away in some hacker's account. But yeah, it's just going to be fascinating to see how it all plays out in the next coming weeks, months, you know, so on and so forth.
So well, one question is how much can you currently how much can you currently trade right now? I haven't I haven't followed up too deeply on that. Like how much does the dip in prices reflect like just lack of liquidity and how much because because like all the value kind of backstopping stuff is gone. Um is is trading unfrozen now? Can you just exchange freely? I don't know. Yeah, that's a well, good depends. question. I mean, I think this was what, like maybe maybe it was like 14, 15%? You know of their of their market cap, right? But so there's still plenty. I think that's around. But yeah, it's a good it's a good question. Like, um, did they did they unfreeze or did the exchanges you know unfreeze you know as well? Uh, yeah, that's mm -hmm. probably something worth looking into as well. So I mean, because like my my counter is just like the Russian ruble has collapsed a little bit less than some people expected. But I would not want to be holding Russian rubles right now. But the Russian you know? ruble bounced back just recently, right? So even with all the sanctions and the stock market getting shut down. Uh, now that they've reopened this, that, and the other, it, it's normalized, which is which is fascinating. I, I encourage you to put your entire portfolio into Russian rubles, but I certainly <laughs> am not going to do that myself. Hey, I'm not saying that I would. I'm just saying that it normalized to where it was before, which is like fascinating because of uh, the severe attack that occurred. But anyways, yeah, it's a different different topic. <laughs> Few thoughts there. So one is, I so I was um, liquidity providing on Ronin, so I I was um, LPing the AXS ETH pair. So uh, I had a bit of ETH there that I think um, is now unbacked, right? Um, and so I guess from my point of view, um, yeah, it's it's hard to assess like what the hacker will do, who they are, right? Um, like it wouldn't surprise me if we go the bounty route where, you know, they give the funds back, they get maybe, you know, 10, 20 million, something like that. And in the end, I think everyone's happy in that case. Um, so that wouldn't surprise me if that doesn't happen. Um, I think that's, a combination of the investors, you know, Andreessen Horowitz and the 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 you know the Axie or the yeah the Axie Treasury itself will you know fund the the, the I mean the Axie as a game cannot go like continue without giving the funds back to the users on on the road, right? It, it, and so this company was was valued like quite a lot of money. So I I and and so they're not going to let that go to waste. Honestly, like I don't know how much money um like the 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 game was making, but I feel like in a few months they would have paid back or or earned back the the money that they would have to refund their users now. So as I'm, you know, potentially at a loss here, I'm actually not super concerned. Also, I'm I'm very well diversified, right? It's not that like my full bags are, are hanging on Ronin. Um but um I'm I'm I think, you know, this this will be all right for the users. Um eventually at, at some point i think i think it's clear that for the hold holders of um axie tokens you know whether that's the axie nfts or axs or you know whatever they clearly believe that the funds are going to be recovered one way or another or um assuming the market's not frozen mm -hmm. you know and 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 the prices reflect something like actual belief mm -hmm. like um i i think i think it's clear that they believe that this is going to be okay i mean it, it's only been like like what? Like, I, I forget, like a week, two weeks, like it hasn't been very long. You know, I mean, I think if we get out like a month, two months, three months, four months, five months, and the money still hasn't been recovered, I mean, I think we're in a very different situation. Um, but one of the things, you know, you're talking about revenue is like when we when we did our Novik report, you know, we modeled out the entire Axie economy. And even without this hack, like the Axie economy was not in good shape. You know, the pure Axie was the game that proved that pure play to earn doesn't work. And that their their monthly revenue was was steadily decreasing because it was intimately tied to growth in the user base, and um, so like I had a bunch of concerns about Axie before this hack came, and so um, I don't know like if you're in the prospect as an investor, it's like pour 650 million more into this or allow them to deplete their treasury they were planning to use for other things. It's like the opportunity cost of what that money could have been used for instead, as opposed to resetting Axie back to where it was before the hack which in my assessment was not already like a great place. Like even if you believe in blockchain gaming, there's like a million different ways to take that direction rather than just pour more bad money after good into the Axie tire fire, to be perfectly mm. frank, is that it's like 650 million could fund a whole bunch of crazy experiments in blockchain gaming rather than like this first idea we had that might work. And, and now like we've identified all these problems with it. Why not invest in a bunch of other weird, new, crazy ideas that could go to the moon mm. potentially? You know, even if 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 you completely believe in the blockchain space and don't have all my negative Nancy opinions, you know, it, it just seems like a weird way to double down. In 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 my opinion, is that it's like, I mean, I don't want to just like say this is the end of Axie because like after I wrote my report, um, Psych Out Alexander, the COO, 
you know, kind of respondents, like, I think you're underestimating community, which to me, red is copium, but I think he had a kernel of truth in there because like the amount of just like hold belief that the Axie community has, like that, that it, it has continued to surprise me. Um, and I, I've learned not to underestimate that, but I also don't believe it can last forever. I think eventually you have to deliver the proof in the pudding. And the challenge with Axie Origin specifically is that the float is based on hope and hope gets replaced with reality whenever you ship something. And so when Axie Origin gets shipped, there's no more talking about how Axie Origin is going to save everything because now it's here and we can evaluate it. Same thing with the land gameplay. Like that's going to be the next thing that's going to save everything if Axie Origin doesn't turn out to be great. Like, And so um, as they ship things, then there's nothing to, to hold out for anymore. And um, so I think, I mean, the timing could not have been worse if they were planning to ship Axie Origin and this got you know, swept out, out from under them. Um, I will, it is interesting that they have chosen to just like plow forward and ship Axie Origin anyway. Cause I mean, you just have to, you just have to assume you're going to get the money back and ship it, you know? So I, I applaud them for, for just like make, making that choice. And I'll be interested in seeing how it goes. But I mean, I think this doesn't correct any of the economic fundamentals that were plaguing them before. Um, and so like, I, I just felt like when, when we wrote a report, you know, I outlined like you guys need to pivot. Like you guys need to pivot away from a model that doesn't work, and then instead they just double down on it. And so um, I think I think the hack, like I think they were in trouble before the hack. Anyway, is my point. Yep. Yeah, I think point. that makes sense. Um, but isn't 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 actually? Uh, I'm not super familiar with their second product, or I'm not sure if it's a expansion pack or an extension. But Axie Origin is a brand new game, correct? Yes, okay. it's a brand new game. The idea is to make it a free to play game that's a lot more accessible. Mm. Um, and so it innovates in that sense that you don't need to pay like $300 to get started. The challenge with Axie Origin is that, I mean, maybe it's going to surprise me, but basically its entire premise is to funnel people into the play to earn gameplay that they've had before, um, at least based off of what they've written. When, when, when it launches and we see maybe, maybe, maybe they will have pivoted substantially away from their old business model and, and it will solve everything and that would be cool. Um, but um, that's, that's just, I'm just going off of what they've written. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess my view on all of this is like, I, I, I don't think it's going to solve everything, um, you know, much like the most successful products that we see in like gaming, free to play, you know, whether it's mobile or, you know, traditional platforms, um, a product's going to have a certain life cycle. And over time, when that life cycle starts diminishing, it's going to get sunsetted and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I, th- I got to give them a lot of credit for trailblazing and trying to figure it out because almost every Web3 product is some variant or plus one or plus three of what Axie has invented. So, you know, is, is this kind of unfortunate set of circumstances going to potentially, you know, increase the vol- velocity of sunsetting for the original Axie Infinity product? Maybe. Um, but I feel like with most products, you know, you're going to learn from your mistakes. Um, the economy change one is really challenging, uh, particularly because of their, you know, inflationary kind of token um, kind of setup. But Origin may or may not solve that, but it, since it's a different product, it's a different thing. And now you might be able to actually move your assets from one game to another. I don't know if that's all in their gameplay or not. I haven't read their white paper or whatever, but yeah, you know, I, the way I see it is like some of this is, you know, business as usual within the gaming industry. Like we've seen this, we've seen this story play out multiple times over. Um, part of this is new and it's innovative and you're going to run into interesting problems there. So yeah, we'll. I guess yeah. To your point, largely, will time will tell if uh, you know Origin is going to help to you know course correct some of the you know the mistakes that they've made along the way and the learnings that they've had. Um, but I kind of remain bullish on them, right? Not only because the, the community factor I think is important, because ultimately, like, what are games if you don't have a bunch of users playing them, right? It just becomes a ghost town. So I think they're they they have some defensibility in that regard. Their community is probably one of the strongest that I've seen in Web three. Um, and they still have, even with this hack, they still have a pretty massive war chest of things to do without asking for more money from the investors. So, you know, maybe the investors are going to do that, like put them in a position where it's like, you know, they're in that, they're in the pain box, right? It's like, you have all the money in in your treasury, in your, you know, like you have your war chest, go play with that. We're not going to, you know, pour more into it, see if you can actually come out of the pain box, which is what they're going to try to do. And then who knows, maybe more interesting things will happen from there. So uh, I, I still remain bullish on them. Uh, I think there's going to be some, again, interesting, I think, innovations and or um, just ability to kind of tighten up areas that they're probably not as familiar with. Um, and, you know, we'll see how it goes. But yeah, interesting. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I am. Um, Quick side note, did we lose Anil? Yeah, we did. Anil oh. got... 
Um, he got hacked. He got hacked. <laughs> his his bridge got exploited by the Ronin hacker, and he dropped. So um, there we go. Rip Anil, yeah. we're missing you. But um, we love you, Anil. Please come back. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, well, thank, thank thank thanks a lot for your opinion there. Yeah, I know I know I come on a little harsh. I just I just want to make sure that we ask the hard questions. Totally, you know, because totally. I, I feel like there's a lot of people who are who are thinking about these things. And it's good you mentioned the treasure because that has been one of Axie's traditional strengths is that they just have. They're just so loaded that even if their first game is designed to like crash and burn, like they they could spin up like 15 games from their treasury. But now like that kind of raises the question of it's like, well, that's one of the prime sources of bailout money, right? Is like, and so like they have to like kind of spend their 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 one um extra life that they have um just to kind of get back to where they were, which which kind of it would make me very sad if I was them. Anyway, Nico, I don't want me to cut you off. You were about to say Yeah, stuff. and I was gonna, I was gonna you know, um, give a comment on, on, on your point of view here. So um, I actually made the prediction at the beginning of this year that if there was one game or team I would have to bet on to make, to be the most successful blockchain game by the end of this year, it was Axie uh, and the Sky made this team. And now probably retrospect, I don't know, let, let's see. My point was um, one, um, as, as you guys have touched upon the, you know, a community is huge, right? I've just had a look at the, the price of the Axie shard, uh, so the AXS token, and on the weekly, you can't even see when the news dropped. Like, it's it it went down like 10% over a week um, together with the rest of the market. So pretty crazy support from the community, I guess. Um, so that's one point. But second point, and I think that's that's for me key, is that I've, I've listened to a bunch of the, the conversations that the Sky Mavis team has had about, you know, the sustainability of their economy. And I think they realize, um, as as many people start doing, that um, the true play and earn will never work um, or is, is very unlikely to work, at least in the short term, right? Um, I've made a post about this. Like for me, true play and earn means that 20% 20 per, 20 or more of your user base may, makes $10 or more per day. That for me, I would consider a play to earn game. Um, and I don't think we're going to see that anytime soon. Um, they realize that as well. And when you say that Axie is, or Axie's economy is doing bad, um, are you looking at that from a lens of people are only playing it to play and earn? Or are you saying that, like, because for me, the way it looks is that the, 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 They've shifted the narrative to, you know, you you can play our game and you know, at least you get something for for your your um what you're doing. Just a one-liner to respond. Um, I mean that at least as of last we analyzed them, the revenue was down on throw for mock. Okay, but yeah, that's fair. I think as a as a if if you um if you analyze the success of the game by the revenue, I guess it, it makes sense that you know, after the huge hype where everyone was trading to the max, um I agree that I, I guess that they're doing not as well, but I think that um, you know that was bound to happen. Like the 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 revenue levels were probably unsustainable and were driven by you know speculation and people coming in in like hoping to make more money. And I don't think we'll see any other game um, achieve the same revenue levels uh, anytime. It's before. more subtle than that actually, because it's not just like oh Destiny Two got popular and now it's less popular. It's the issue that most games get popular, they spike and then they settle on a baseline. Mm -hmm. And um, they make money continuously based on how many numbers of users mm -hmm. they have. The problem was, I mean, I need to, you know, I haven't updated from our last analysis, but just based off our last analysis and, you know, a little bit of a follow-up we did a couple months later. Um, so this is like current as of like two, three months ago. Um, they make money not off of how many users they have, but how many users are adding. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. The problem is that it's, it's second derivative, not like marching across the line itself because they make money off of, growth, not absolute number of users. So it's normally okay. It's completely normal for every game to like go to the moon, everyone's playing Elden Ring, and then like five, ten years later from now, people will still be playing Elden Ring and buying new copies of it, and it's less, but it's still like making money off that baseline. Like I still sell copies of Defender's Quest today, even though like barely anyone's playing it. You know, like a, a couple copies a week. Um, awesome, but Axie makes money off... Yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> but like Axie makes money off of the growth percentage itself based off of their snake eating its own tail business mm -hmm. model. And, and that's the problem. There's crypto games that have sustainability. 
You know, um, Splinterlands is a good example. Mm -hmm. um, where and Zedrun is a good example. Like, I mean, Zedrun has like a very small number of players, but it's like naively sustainable. You know, um, and so like actually did like way more volume. But the problem is 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 the trajectory in the model of mm -hmm. it. It's not like it got big and now it's crashed a little. That's fine. It's it's like you you can't monetize growth itself because growth itself can't last forever. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to monetize off of all, of of any amount of users and preferably a high number of users mm -hmm. and and that that's kind of the issue it's, it's a little it's a little subtle nope. but that 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 that's the heart of my critique i agree and i i don't think that they're gonna suddenly regrow their revenues in the way that they used to right in the same way that they used to i think the way i see this play out and i think they realize this is they need to build a open and immersive economy around Axie. And I think that's what they're gonna, going for with their land gameplay. And let's save the whole the, like, land discussion. <laughs> yeah, I saw you already. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, give, my stump, I'll give my stump speech later <laughs> on some other podcast. Yeah. Um, anyway, so we can save that for another time. I think in the end, um, if, if they build you know, a, an ecosystem with different games in which you can use Axies with different kind of resources, I think there is where you know, they will build a thriving economy where they can take small, um, you know, a fraction of, of every every transaction within that that world, um, and 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 that's what I see their end game is, um, and and that's what I've been hearing from them. Although obviously I can't speak, um, look in their, inside their heads, um, and I'm actually interviewing uh, Philip La in a few weeks, so he's he's a new game lead there. So uh, yeah, that was that was a genuinely solid move they made. You know, and um, Philip La, for those of y'all who don't know in the podcast, he's uh, previously. Is it product or project manager? I can never get which P it is. Yeah, at, um, PM at, at Niantic. At Niantic. Yeah. yeah, on Pokemon Go, right? And I mean, I, I've talked to that guy and he's brilliant. Mm. And th those are the kind of moves they need to be making is um, basically acknowledging that they need more outside expertise, like not just in security, but also in stuff like, I mean, one of, one of the classic problems with um, Axie, for instance, is because so much of the initial interest was just financial, like it, it was... It was this like tree that sprung up that had shallow roots, right? You know, whereas like if you look at the difference between something like Pokemon and how it became just this massive, like worldwide brand, you know, like I mean, just as simple of an example as, and this is something I think they're they're starting to fix in Origin, is like axes are kind of like an undifferentiated mass. You know, it's that classic NFT like just permutation thing. Mm. It's like there's no aspect of like Pikachu's my favorite. Mm. You know, um, even though people are getting like tattoos and like little plushies, it's like you don't have that deep degree of hook because at the end of the day, an axie is like a little blob with a, you know, permutation it's face. Like ears and arms and, and nose. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And there's so many other variables like that. That's just one out of like 50 variables. And people like Philip Law get that on a deep level. And so if people like Philip Law and other people with that like deep experience and like knowledge of what makes things connect beyond the surface kind of level understanding of community that I've mostly seen out of crypto games, you know, they could transform stuff. I mean, I have my whole hypothesis that in the end, the blockchain will basically evaporate and um, we'll get some ideas that came out of blockchain without getting caught up on the implementation of blockchain. Um, I think that's the future, but without, that'll be a whole podcast for its mm -hmm. own someday. But um, I feel like if you, you know, Axie needs to move away from this whole like rhetoric they sold themselves on in its early days and move towards being more like a conventional game and using blockchain less of a we are all gonna make it kind of thing and and, and um, basically move towards a, just treating it as a less worse PayPal and like an open API for you know for, for, for moving stuff around. Um, but don't and I you think, think that they're already doing that? I feel no. like I feel like the industry as a whole is moving towards that, right? So I can I can reverse fraudulent transactions occasionally on PayPal. Um, no, so I don't so, I don't mean it. I don't. So let let me let me let me take a step back. Yeah, go, and go like for Clarify it. what I mean, right? So the concept and some of the challenges I think that we're faced with, like looking at someone like Axie as an early kind of uh, you know like tip of the spear on like how Web three was being formed, particularly for games. You know, they helped coin the term play to earn, which is now also being, you know, thrown around differently. Like, um, you know, I mean, I think way back when I wrote for Navic and, you know, I think on one of these podcasts, I was talking about play and own. Now I hear play to own, uh, you know, you know, various variations. Right? But the point is, like the dynamic of, you know, this change, which I think is inevitable, which is, you know, in, in like five years time. Right. Users, players, they're going to actually value their pro time properly. 
Meaning if they can value their time and the games that are being developed has to be fun first versus monetary value first, that, that shift is already happening in my opinion, at least from the ecosystem that I'm involved in. And so if that becomes a norm where you have to be fun first, but then because I value my time and because I own these things, there's value that I am then creating from that and I essentially become the harvester then I think the way that you approach your behavioral outcomes as a designer, as a product manager, so on and so forth, and the way I engage with these D apps, it's going to change. So uh, I think the starting point of where it was created a lot of, there's a different set of confluences that is challenging to solve for. Yes, like this idea around not being able to reverse, all that stuff is still in play. But I think, again, over time, I think that's going to change. And you know, from most of at least the, the, the newer, let's call them Web3, I don't know, 2.0 wave of games that are now coming downstream. Probably some will be released this year, maybe next year. I think they're really looking at that seriously. And I think we're going to see that shift where it's like, you, you know, if you had the equivalent of a free-to-play game versus, let's say, a blockchain-enabled game, and they're equal in terms of their fun factor, um, I don't know. I, I think players would gravitate. Not saying all of them will, but I think... There's a, there's a good subset of players that will gravitate towards that, which I think will you know, be a di different way of engaging, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I get what you're saying. And like, I mean, the, the thing I would always say is it's important to be educated by the way in which games have been financialized for the last 30 years. Um, in the way there's been, like, the problem is you can't have a system where like the value is provided artificially by digging holes and filling them in again. Like as a good example in Destiny 2, like, um, if I am having trouble with the mission, like, I can go and hire a mercenary, like a real-world mercenary, to come in and play with me and carry me through that mission. And they're providing value to me. I'm having more fun because I, I want a big brother that I don't have sure. to come in and yeah, play the game with Yeah, they carry you, right? Yeah. Right, right, right. Exactly. You know, I mean, and that, that, is, that isn't anything new, right? And you, you've seen this in... Um, the, the thing is, is that like the system for facilitating that is, is maybe not like first party, first class on the system. And uh, my, my kind of position is that it's like, it would be nice if we had like a less worse PayPal kind of protocol for that. But I don't think like the immutability, like, like I want to avoid falling into these like worst of both world situations mm -hmm. where you have the horrible onboarding of crypto and you have the not your keys, not my problem of not your keys, not my customer service problem of, of, of blockchain issues at the same time. And, and I think like just, just like getting a little unfixed from it's like, okay, we're going to change the world, but it has to be with this 14-year-old technology and nothing else. Um, I, and I, my, my prediction is that blockchain is going to evolve into all these protocols and technologies that actually have nothing to do with the things we're working with now. Same thing happened in AI, by the way. That's how that took over the world. Here's a new numerical model. It's not the same one we were talking about eight years ago, but this one actually works. Um, AI wins. It's like, okay, cool. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I largely agree with that, right? I, I think there's, I mean, look, with, with things that are coming and, you know, with, with the usage and new use cases and, you know, case studies of things coming out, it's going gonna, it's gonna to evolve and iterate and adapt to a thing. Um, yeah, I just, I, I'm just pretty positive about it just because, you know, if this is like the biggest, like, you know, with the Axie hack, if this is like the biggest thing that's occurred so far, and I don't know, there's throughput through it that at least I can see. Um, yeah, I, I think it's going to be for the benefit ultimately for the players, which I think is the most important thing, right? Mm -hmm. If I can, if I could, I appreciate your comments here. If I could move things a little away from things I'm consistently grumpy about and something into a little bit slightly more neutral territory for the benefit of everyone. No, um, I, I love the, I love, I love the position. Good, this, this is why we love you. Yeah, yeah, but, come on to this one. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but still like a, a more narrow technical point, which I think I, I'm just as interested in is L2s versus L1s. Hmm. Like a common security argument is that the more surface area you create, it doesn't matter how many fancy auditing stickers you stick on it and how many PhDs you get to look at it. You increase the surface area, you increase the complexity. There's going to be a vulnerability. You're just not going to notice it. You know, um, and so like that's the Vitalik argument that it's like to don't mess around with L2s. Like, is this evidence of that? You know, I or um, you know because we've seen stuff with Solana and Polygon too. You know, like are L2s the way forward, or do we just need to move to L1s? Like L1s that are like like is the way forward is like they should have made their own L1, or we should just all wait for Ethereum to to merge to to, to do the big 
proof of stake merge or, or, or what? What are your opinions? Sorry to take over. From my side, no, it's it's an important discussion. I feel like we've touched upon like five things in the last two minutes that I want to <laughs> have like a whole single episode on. Um, from my point of view, the way I look at this, um, so one, I want to just tell you that when it comes to not my keys, not my customer service and, and these types of, of, of and the, the horrible wallets UI for the moment, I think... Um, over the next years, I think we're going to see some some great innovations on that side. There's now smart contract wallets. I did an interview with um, Michael Sanders from Horizon, who's built um, Sequence, it's called. It's, it's amazing. Like, I've tried it. Um, if you ever want to play Skyweaver, give it a try. You'll see that the wallet is it's insane. Anyway, um, to come back on the, the layer two. Did you say Skyweaver? Yeah. I think Anthony, um, my co-consultant, was working with that, and he was like being like, this is insane. This I can't believe it was this easy. There you go. Positive words from Lars. What's happening? I don't know what's saying now. Um, no, anyway, <laughs> we're, we're talking about um, layers. So the, w- the way I see this is um, we're going to have a like a layered uh, blockchain ecosystem where you know the more layers you go up, the more like transactions and scale you need. And so I think on the bottom, like basically like no individual will ever do any layer one Ethereum transaction anymore. That will all happen on different layers. Um, and so you're going to have. Um, I, I don't think we're we're going to solve the blockchain trilemma, but you know the the base is going to be super decentralized, super safe, and and there is going to be millions settled every every second. And then as you move up layer wise, I think you know transactions are going to be bundled, um, scale is going to increase, decentral decentralization is going to reduce slightly, um, and I think you know it, with that as as you move up, you're going to have you're going to end up with something that's not really super decentralized and safe, but the value of transacted there is going to be negligible. So it, it it's like, there's always going to be this, um, this straight up there. Anyway. Yeah, that's, that, that's my thoughts. Any, any final, final remarks? Because you have, we have to wrap this things up. I, I feel like we could keep going and we didn't even touch up on our, even our second topic. Um, but we kind of did oh, as well. Sorry. And, um, <laughs> no, I think this was, was amazing and super yeah, valuable. So yeah. see a fi- final, yeah. final remarks. I appreciate it. Don't we need to make bold predictions? Isn't that your thing? It is my thing. Do you want to make one, Lars? Have you prepared Yeah, Lars, one? you want to make one? <laughs> okay, bold prediction. I honestly have no grounds for knowing, but I think they won't get the money back. That's my bold prediction. They will get the money back. <laughs> okay, is that your bold prediction? CA, what about you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think they're going to get some of their money back. Money back. <laughs> Good. The all hedging all the time channel here on the Metacast, exactly. just for exactly. you. Hey, but like, right. I, 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 I'm, I'm just going by precedence. Right. Like, do I think that yeah. they're going to get 100% back? Probably not. But do I think they're going to get a majority of it back? I think so. Cool. Okay. We'll see who's right. Probably you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have exactly. no skin in the game. I, I, I mean, look, as, as just another, you know, competitor, colleague, you know, in the space, like, obviously, I want, you know, them to do well and succeed, right? Because they're doing bold things and I want their community to be, you know, uh, yeah, enumerated and, you know, safe as well. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just super interesting to see, but I, I think I think something good will happen. The yeah. optimistic me. I, mean, I think just for my 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 final thought is it's like as much as I, I come across as negative sometimes, um, I want to make clear that like the position I come from is that I fight for the users, and that I just think um, I'm not here to like hate on anybody or anybody's hard work, but like I'm always going to empathize with the little guy at the bottom who put trust in people. And so I think when you've got billion dollar valuations, you're playing with fire and you need to respect that. And that is where everything I do and say comes from. And so it's not out of a desire to tear anyone down or to, or to, or to poop on anyone's work or anything like that. It's like, I would love to live in a world where people succeed and get filthy rich and, and don't hurt anyone in the process. And, and, and that's just where I come from, just, just to make that clear, is um, I just want to make sure that whatever happens to Sky Mavis, the people who put money at stake and the average average guy and gal, et cetera, you know, does, doesn't get hurt in the process. Yeah, Beautiful. 100%. Yep. It, maybe this isn't as bold of a prediction, but um, one of the things that I am pretty bullish on, and I'll, I'll just say it here, is you know how like in traditional free-to-play products, when, when we see a product have like an annual run rate of like $100 million, we're like, yeah, that game is crushing it, right? Because like mm-hmm. you're, you're sitting probably in like the top yeah, top 10, top 20, you know, if you're doing that kind of revenue. Um, I think this next wave of uh, Web3, you know, games that are coming, uh, I think there's going to be several that's going to hit that mark. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, because there's some really interesting, you know, projects that aren't just being built by some small team, you know, out of, you know, some basement somewhere. Like, 
these are like legit. What time frame? What's that? Um, I, what I time think frame? I think within the next, I, w- I would say, fourteen to sixteen months, we're gonna see some some actually like some really solid games. Like if you, you knew nothing about it and you just saw gameplay and you look at that, and you're like, oh, I wonder what you know console that's on, or I wonder what, if I can download that on Steam. I think that will be the initial reaction, and then you're gonna find out, oh crap, this is a blockchain game, right? And I think it'll you know change the perception at least somewhat. Uh, you know, potential, you know, others like maybe in the traditional space that look at the current crop of game revs now and they're looking at it and saying uh, that looks like, a, you know, you know, Nintendo era, Super Nintendo Genesis era games. I think that perception is going to change in that time frame. Mm-hmm. Like with the and these are some things you could put your 625 million towards. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> hey, land gameplay, man. And Origin, what are you talking about? Um, uh. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, um, I've tried Guild of Guardians, um, the pre-alpha. Um that's been fun. It's been good. It, it looks great. I think you know, if you see that, you you wouldn't think it was a blockchain game. So, um, yeah, uh, I've been liking that one. Uh, shout out to the Immutable team. Um, they're they're doing great things, and I I really like uh I like them. All right. So with that, um, this was great episodes. Lars, thank you for being the 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 critical thinker here and um you know looking out for the small guy and i think you know you're one of the biggest stars on this on the show um as are you ca you know, oh gosh very very neutral and and always so um you know uh how would you call it well i appreciate you guys putting up with me i i i, I learn a lot from y'all iron sharpens iron and i just i just i just don't want anyone to get hurt and that's what motivates me there you go i am um, I'm, I'm gonna do so we basically need to like get another podcast going where we talk about the current state i also have some ideas about you know i talked about um sustainable play to earn economies uh, i have ideas how that might work um and who else to to uh pitch it to than lars who's gonna crush my hopes and dreams um so yeah, we'll, we'll probably You'll be stronger for it exactly exactly no no that's totally true um cool well that was it uh ca lars thank you so much for joining me and listener thank you for listening in um maybe i should shout out so we're, we're on youtube so if you're on youtube like and subscribe um i always love saying that I, i've heard that so much now i can say it myself um and if you're on, on spotify you can like us there as well so that'd be great much appreciated join our discord if you want to you know have these discussions there and with that, the Metacast by Navic is out, and we look forward to speaking to you in the next episode. Cheers. Bye.